Hi everybody, hope you're having a good day. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about identities. So last night your homework was, part of your homework was to memorize the identities in the green boxes on page 446 and 447 and 445. Now some of those you are already completely comfortable with. The reciprocal identities, I'm looking on page 445, the reciprocal identities you already know those, you memorize those. You memorize that the cosecant is the reciprocal of the sine, which means it's one over the sine. You um, may not have realized though, and I don't think we put two and two together, um, those um, quo the quotient identities. The tangent can be written as sine over cosine. Now that should make sense to you if you stop and think that sine, yeah, oh, I better use a different variable, sorry about that. Sine is y over r and cosine is x over r. Well, you already know that tangent is y over x. So if you put these two fractions over each other, if you put y over r over x over r, that's y over r times r over x, so it makes sense that tangent could be written as sine over cosine, and likewise cotangent as cosine over sine. The Pythagorean identities are huge, and we absolutely need to know those. Um, we use them all the time. They are used constantly in the work that we're getting ready to do. So let's take a look at the scenario and make sure it makes sense to you why it is that sine squared plus cosine squared is one. Big news. Boxes, stars, highlighters, everything for that one. Now here's the deal. Here's a tri uh, little reference triangle. X, Y, and R. Here's angle theta. It is absolutely true that x squared plus y squared equals r squared. You can't disagree with that. If you take that equation and divide everything by r squared, this side, of course, is 1. This is x over r squared, <coughs> y over r squared, well, x over r is cosine, so we have cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1. Big, big news. If you take this identity and divide it by either sine squared or cosine squared, I'll divide by sine squared this first time, you get one plus, okay, now look, cosine over sine. That's cotangent. One over sine is cosecant. So the other two Pythagorean identities are just this one, the main one, divided either by sine squared to get this, or divided by cosine squared to get one plus tangent squared equals secant squared. Okay, the co-function identities, again, let's come back and take a look at this picture for a minute. Would you agree that the measure, okay, this is a right triangle, so if that angle is theta, this angle would be 90 minus theta, because these two have to add up to 90. So if I look at this triangle, I can say, that the sine of theta is y over r. Yeah, we knew that. But look at this angle. If I look at this angle, the cosine of that angle, oops, the cosine of 90 minus theta, the cosine of this angle is also y over r. In other words, the sine of the angle is equal to the cosine of its complement. Remember, 
Two angles that add up to 90 are called complementary. So these angles are complements of each other. Hence the word co-function. The CO is an abbreviation for complementary. So all of the co's are the are talking about the complements of the original. So for example, the tangent of an angle will equal the cotangent of the complement and vice versa. So don't get all hung up with those formulas. It makes perfectly good sense. Each of the functions has a co-function. And what that means, sine, cosine, secant, cosecant. What that means is that the secant of the angle, the original angle, is equal to the cosecant of the complement of that angle. And the complement is 90 minus theta. That's how those work. Odd even, we have talked about what odd and even means in the past. Basically, what it means to be odd is if you, and you have a function, if you input a negative, you will get a negative out. In other words, this would be odd. If we had a function and we knew that f of 2 was negative 4, so we have some random function and we know that f of 2 is negative 4. If we put in a negative 2 then, if this is an odd function, if we put in a negative 2, we get a negative out. Well, the negative of this would be a positive 4. In other words, f of x, f of negative x, equals negative f of x. When you put a negative in, you change the sign of the output. A negative input changes the sign of the output. That's what it means to be odd. Even means if f of 2 is negative 4, then f of negative 2 is also negative 4. In other words, a negative input has absolutely no impact on the output. So if you put a negative in, it doesn't matter. All of your trigonometric functions are odd, except secant and cosine. The only two functions that are even are secant and cosine. And what that means is that if you take the cosine of 60 and the cosine of negative 60, they are exactly the same. Inputting a negative into a cosine curve makes no difference. That should make sense to you in terms of the curve. Because the, remember, being even means you have symmetry about the y-axis. And doesn't the cosine have symmetry about the y-axis? Yes, it does. Okay, now let's do a few problems. Last night I asked you to do um, a few. Let me go through those with you just to make sure that you are um, okay with them. So we'll do those homework problems, and then we'll do a couple extra fun problems, and then um, we'll be done for the day. So here we go. First I ask you to do a few in the quick review five through eight. So that's just factoring. One of the things we're going to have to be able to do is factor. And you have already learned how to factor as seventh graders, eighth graders, ninth graders, tenth graders, and eleventh graders. So I'm not too worried about you. And I want to just emphasize that there are no magic bullets. Sometimes we just have to take the time to figure it out. And that's the best way to do it. Remember that tonight you are going to be factoring with trigonometric functions, not with plain letters. So let's make sure we're understanding the big picture here, not some gimmicky things, 
the big picture. Here we go. We're going to factor this guy. These are all trinomials, by the way, so ideally they'll factor into two binomials. We know that when we factor, it's a reverse FOIL process. So whatever I put here and here is going to multiply to give me that. So that's going to be A and A. I don't have much choice there. That's nice. Whatever I put here and here has to multiply to give me B squared. So that's going to be B and B. I don't have any choice. Now, I need to put a sign in here, a plus or a minus. I'll take my clue from that right there. Keep in mind that that is a positive B squared, so these two signs have to be the same. Positive times positive or negative times negative. Since that's a negative, I'll put two negatives, and there's my answer. To be absolutely sure, I will FOIL it back and get A squared minus AB minus AB plus B squared. I am factored. I'm going to do exactly the same thing here, but now I have a little bit more choice. Now I have to decide if I'm going to put a 4U and a U, or a 2U and a 2U. Those are my two choices because I have a 4U squared here in the front, and that can be achieved by taking 4 times 1 or 2 times 2. Those are both legitimate options for me. The end spot is not, there are no options, so it has to be 1 and 1. Those are the only things that multiply together to give me 1, unless I go in the fraction world, which I'm not going to do. These are all pluses, so I'm going to go ahead and fill in plus signs here, and then I have to decide which one of those works. Well, I decide by doing my FOIL check. This one would give me 4u squared plus 4u plus u. That is not going to work. This one gives me 4u squared plus 2u plus 2u. That one does work, so that's my answer. Here we go. Again, I have absolutely no options when it comes to what goes here and here. It has to be 2x and x. Now, I do have an option for the last spot. It has to be 2y and 1y, but I could do it in this order, 2y and y, or y and 2y. And I have no idea, it will make a difference in my problem, and I have no idea which one's going to work. So one more time, I know that my first terms have to be 2x and x. That's the only way to get 2x squared. My last terms have to be 2y times y, but I don't know whether I should put the 2y here and the y here, or the y here and the 2y here. I know it's one or the other. I also know that in order to achieve a negative, one of these has to be positive and one has to be negative. Now, those might be flipped. I'll figure that out in a minute. So I'm going to FOIL it back together and see what I get. If I FOIL this top one, I get 2x squared minus 2xy plus 2xy. That is not going to give me what I want, so that does not work. 2x squared minus 4xy plus yx minus 2y squared. Lo and behold, there it is. If the signs had not worked out, I could do some rearranging with that, but they did, so I'm good. I'm ready to move on. First term has to be a 2v and a v. Second term has to be a 3 and a 1, but I don't, again, I don't know if I put the 3 here and the 1 here, or the 1 here and the 3 here, so I'm just going to try them both. I do know I need a negative, so again, I'm going to have a plus minus. I'm not sure what order those are going to be in. I can change them later if I need to. So now I'll FOIL. I get my 2v squared, I'm doing this one. I get my 2v squared minus 2v plus 3v. That does not work. So I'll FOIL here. Remember, i got to have a negative 5. This does not add up to a negative 5. So 2v squared minus 6v plus v. Whoops, there it is. Perfect. Everything worked out perfectly. And there's my factorization. Then I ask you to actually do some exercises. So you may have had a little bit of confusion with these. Hopefully not. The first few were pretty easy. The idea is use those green box identities 
to help you break things down or cancel things or whatever. So in number nine, we have tan x cosine x. Now, tangent x, one of my pieces of advice for you is, as you are simplifying these things, always change them into sines and cosines if possible. So tangent, I'm going to rewrite as sine over cosine. And I am multiplying that by cosine over 1. I am multiplying these two things together. Well, what happens? These cancel and leave you with just sine. So you have simplified this expression as the directions indicated. You have simplified this expression down into just sine. All right, what's going to happen here? Well, let's do exactly the same thing. This will be cosine over sine times sine over cosine. Whoa, 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 what happens this time? Our cosines cancel, our sines cancel, and we are left with just one. That should make sense to you because cotangent and tangent are reciprocals of each other, and what happens when you multiply reciprocals? You get one. All right, now we've got one that looks a little bit more complicated, but we are not going to panic. We're going to be calm and relaxed. We have secant times sine pi over 2 minus y. And then I'm going to go ahead and write down the next one, too. We have cotangent sine. Okay. Now, what's secant? By definition, what is secant? 1 over cosine. What is this? Now, I know a minute ago when I was going through this, I was using 90. I was using the degree measure. But remember, this is 90. This is 90 minus theta, or 90 minus y. So this is a co-function identity. It's got a complement in it. 90 minus y would be a complementary angle. So sine of the complement is cosine. Remember the co-functions. So this is cosine y. Well, what happens when you multiply 1 over cosine y times cosine y? You just get 1. This is one of your identities. That is the cosine. Here we go. This was just like the first one we did. Cos cotangent is cosine over sine. Sine over 1 cancels. That one reduces to cosine. Hopefully you're getting the hang of this a little bit. Um, next we have oh, one that looks a little harder, but I think we can handle it. Um, 1 plus tangent squared over cosecant squared. And 1 minus cosine squared over sine. Sine minus cosine cubed and oh my. We'll get that one in a minute. That's a big one. Okay, so here we go. Uh oh, uh oh. Now I know you're just getting started, so you don't get little pitter patters in your heart just yet when you see one plus tangent squared, but you, sh you should. Soon, you should. One plus tangent squared is one of your Pythagorean identities. Anytime I see a squared function, I first think about, oh, is that a Pythagorean identity? And indeed it is. 1 plus tangent squared is secant squared. So I'm simply going to take that tangent squared, and I'm going to rewrite it as a secant squared over cosecant squared. Now, we can clean that up a little bit, because what, what's, what's secant squared? Secant squared is 1 over cosine squared. And cosecant squared is 1 over sine squared. So what's happening here? We are taking 1 over cosine squared and dividing it by 1 over sine squared, which means we are multiplying it by sine squared over 1. 
So what do we end up with? 1 over cosine squared times sine squared over 1 is sine squared over cosine squared, which is tangent squared. So this mess just reduced down to tangent squared. Some of you right now are quivering with anxiety. Do not, do not. You will get the hang of this. It comes with practice, so we'll just keep chipping away at it. Now let's look at this one. A minute ago I said when I see a squared function, I immediately think of my Pythagorean identities, and I do. So I got one minus cosine squared. Now you're thinking, wait, Mrs. Ford, there is no Pythagorean identity that says 1 minus cosine squared. And you are right. There is one, though, that says sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. If I take that equation and subtract cosine squared from both sides, it would say sine squared equals 1 minus cosine squared. So I'm going to take my basic my fundamental trigonometric identity, sine squared plus cosine squared is 1, and I'm going to subtract cosine squared from both sides. It says then that sine squared is the same as 1 minus cosine squared. So when I look up here and I see 1 minus cosine squared, I'm going to substitute in sine squared for that. Because 1 minus cosine squared is sine squared. So now I've got sine squared over sine, which reduces, cancels, whatever, to just sine. Now, one of the things as we are simplifying these expressions and, and soon proving some identities, one of the things we have to get used to is doing all kinds of substitutions like we did here, take out or replace 1 minus cosine squared with sine squared. We have to be able to cancel things and combine things. We also have to be able to factor things. So when I look at that, I see cosine times 1 minus cosine squared. Now what about 1 minus cosine squared. We just talked about that. Take a cosine out, it leaves us with 1 minus cosine squared. What is 1 minus cosine squared? It's sine squared. So we have cosine sine squared. That problem reduces to just cosine sine squared. And then we've got this last monster. Looks horrible. Let's see, we've got sine squared plus tangent squared plus cosine squared all over secant. Okay, now listen, you guys. Again, you're just getting started, but we've talked already today a couple of different times about this. We need to be able to pick that out of the problem. That needs to kind of stand out. Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So now I have 1 plus tangent squared over secant. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. There goes my heart pitter-pattering again. 1 plus tangent squared. 1 plus tangent squared is secant squared. So now I've got secant squared over secant, which simply reduces to plain old secant. So that big, ugly, hideous problem reduced down to just secant. Now let's see, I also assigned 23 to 26. Let's take a look at those. Here we go. 23. Wow, that looks bad. Who 
who's he, who's he, who's he? Well, let's take a look at it. First things first. See this guy right here? Whenever you see 90 minus x or pi over 2 minus x, what should you think of? What should pop into your head? Yes, co-function. So that's going to be rewritten as cotangent x. So now I'm here. Now do you notice you've got a cosecant over a cosecant squared? So we can cancel that. So we have cotangent over cosecant. These are being multiplied. As long as they're being multiplied, you can cancel out pieces of it. What's cotangent? Let's think about this for a minute. Cotangent. What's the definition? Oh, you got lots of them. Don't say x over y. Don't say um, adjacent over opposite. Say cosine over sine. What is cosecant? Cosecant is 1 over sine. Well, look, gang, what's going to happen when you take cosine over sine and multiply it by sine over 1? Because you're dividing by 1 over sine, so we're going to multiply. The answer is just cosine. So that big hideous mess simplified all the way down to cosine. And how did we do that? We knew our identities and we did the arithmetic. First thing, this became cotangent. Then we did regular cancellation. Then we used our identities to rewrite these two. And then we did some more arithmetic and cancellation and got our answer. Wow, that's pretty cool. Let's look at the next one. Right here. Now be careful, this is not a Pythagorean identity, it's not squared. The identities, uh, uh, 1 plus tangent squared is secant squared, but 1 plus tangent is not secant. That, that relationship only works if they are squared. So you're not going to be able to substitute anything in for that numerator. However, you are going to be able to substitute something in for tangent. What is tangent? Mm -hmm. Don't say y over x, don't say opposite over adjacent say sine over cosine. And likewise, cotangent is cosine over sine. Now I'm going to do something that I do a lot. You know that there are always, always, always more than one way to solve a problem. But through years and years and years, and zillions and zillions of problems, the easy, I have found, that the easiest way to take care of this, this is called a complex fraction. It's a big fraction with little fractions inside of it. The, big, the best way to take care of that, the most efficient way, the fastest and least you know, space consuming way, is to simply multiply each piece of the problem by the common denominator of all the little fractions. So the little fractions are 1 sine over cosine, 1 cosine over sine. I am going to multiply every one of those by cosine sine. Now, the reason that I am doing this, the reason that I am multiplying by the common denominator of the little fractions is so that I can cancel those fractions out. Here's what's going to happen. Here in the first term, it just is cosine sine. It's cosine sine times one. I can't do anything with that. But here, these cosines are going to cancel and all I am going to have left is sine squared. This fraction is gone. This is just sine squared. Denominator, same thing. I'm going to have cosine sine. And then these are going to cancel. So I'll have plus cosine squared. Now a minute ago, I canceled cosecant and cosecant squared. And that was completely legit because this is a multiplication. 
You cannot cancel anything. No canceling at this point because of these additions. Additions and subtractions eliminate your opportunity for canceling unless you have factored first. So let's look at that. I wonder if I can factor. Sure I can. What can I take out of the top? I can take out a sign. And that would leave me with cosine plus sine. Caution again, this is not one. The Pythagorean identity says cosine squared plus sine squared is one. None of those identities work unless it is squared. So that's nothing. Denominator, take out a cosine. Now I have factored rupees. What do you notice? This cancels. Perfectly allowable, you may cancel after you factor. You may cancel your factors after you factor. What's left? Sine over cosine, which is tangent. So that reduced all the way down to tangent. Okay, two more, and then we'll look at some more. This is 25. Oh, wait. Okay, well, we got squares all over the place. Don't wait. And whenever I see squares, I think about my Pythagorean identities. I'm writing down the last problem here so I don't forget it. Okay, so I think of my Pythagorean identities. I think I'll just write them down. Um, should I write them, I guess, over here? So uh, my Pythagorean identities involving secant would be 1 plus tangent squared is secant squared, and 1 plus cotangent squared is cosecant squared. Okay, so I'm going to look at that carefully, and I'm going to think a little bit. All right, let's see. Let's distribute this negative so we get rid of all these parentheses. So I'll have secant squared plus cosecant squared minus tangent squared minus cotangent squared. Now, look at this identity right here. What if we did what we did a minute ago and rearranged it a little bit? What if we subtracted tangent squared from both sides? Let's subtract tangent squared from both sides. We'll have 1 equal to secant squared minus tangent squared. Subtract tangent squared from both sides. Secant squared minus tangent squared then just equals 1. So let's look up here. What do you see here and here? A secant squared minus tangent squared. That just equals 1. And guess what? If we do the same with this one, we'll have 1 equal to cosecant squared minus cotangent squared. So cosecant squared minus cotangent squared makes another 1. So I have this one plus this one. So the answer to that problem is just Again, this is day one for you. I don't expect this stuff to pop out like it does to me, but you should be starting to get in the groove of, if I see squares, at least I should think about these identities. And I don't have to use them in the form they are written in the green box. 
I can rearrange them and use them in other forms. All right, this looks bad. But again, because I'm old and I do, do this for a living and I love these things, <clears throat> this just pops off the page at me. We just talked about it. What's secant squared minus tangent squared? That numerator, secant squared minus tangent squared, that numerator is just one. Look at that denominator. It's a different variable. It's a V instead of a U, but who cares? Cosine squared plus sine squared is always one. The answer to that problem is one. Awesome. Okay, okay. Let's take a look then, if you would, in your book. We're gonna just try a few more because you're gonna get to practice a few more tonight. Won't do a whole bunch. I know you're probably getting a little bored. Oh, although this is kind of exciting stuff. Let's look at number 27. It says sine x times tan plus cotan. And our job is to simplify it. Okay, well we've done some of this already. We're going to simplify it. What do you think about tan plus cotan? What might we do with that? Please don't think there's an identity. There's no identity for tan plus cotan. Your identities are your Pythagorean identities, your reciprocal identities, um, your co-function identities, and the odd even things. The odd even things have to have negatives in there. You don't see any negatives in here, so I'm not using that one. The uh, co-functions have to have 90 minus theta. You don't see that in here anywhere. What, what are we gonna do? There's no squared, so it's not Pythagorean. What are we gonna do? What's tangent? Tangent is sine over cosine. What's cotangent? Cosine over sine. Now, there are a couple different ways you can do this. My suggestion, and, and again, who knows what's best. My suggestion would be, let's go ahead and distribute and see what happens. Let's distribute. So if I distribute this times this, I'm gonna get sine squared over cosine. If I distribute this times this, I'm just going to get cosine. Because when I take sine times cosine over sine, the sines will cancel out. So this is like cosine over one. What do you think we'll do now? Think about regular arithmetic. If you want to add fractions in regular arithmetic, what do you do? You get a common denominator. So what will my common denominator be? Cosine. So this one is going to have to be multiplied by a cosine over a cosine. So now I'll have sine squared over cosine plus cosine squared over cosine. I can add them together now. They have the same denominator. So I'll have sine squared plus cosine squared over cosine. Wait a minute. Hear those bells ringing? Your heart pitter-pattering? What sine squared plus cosine squared? Sure. 1 over cosine. You may certainly leave it as 1 over cosine, or you could rewrite it as secant. Either one is fine. 1 over cosine or secant, either one. Perfect. Let's try some more. Let's see, that was 27. How about 28? It looks kind of yucky. These are kind of a challenge, aren't they? It's kind of fun. What do you think, as we're writing it down, this is number 28 on page 452, as we're writing it down, you should be having some thoughts that aren't like sheer terror. You should be thinking about, oh, well, wait a minute. 
Tangent, is that cosine? Yeah. Tangent can be rewritten. How can tangent be rewritten? Tangent is sine over cosine. And this, anytime you see a 90 minus theta, anytime you see a 90 minus theta, pi over 2 minus theta, you're thinking co function. So, what's the co function for cosine? It would be psi. This is an identity in your green box. Ida wouldn't waste any memorization space on those, though. They all are the co functions, complements. When you see a 90 minus theta, you're thinking co function. The co function for the cosine is the sine. Okay, now what happens here? What happens when I multiply sine over cosine times cosine? Don't those cancel? So now I have sine minus sine plus sine. So the answer to this problem is just sine. They look so big and scary. Golly gee whiz, they're pretty simple in the end. Okay, let's look at 29. It's huge. I think you can do it. This is number 29, sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant. So we're just multiplying them all together. Now this is one big giant multiplication problem. Multiplication is commutative associative, all those things. We can do this whatever order we want. What happens when you multiply a sine times a cosecant? Just think about that for a minute, you guys. What's their relationship? They are reciprocals. What happens when you multiply sine times one over sine? They cancel, you get one. How about cosine times secant? What happens when you multiply a cosine times a secant? They cancel and you get one. What is left? Tangent. Easy, easy problem. If you remember the relationship between reciprocals, when you multiply them, they cancel out. All right, let's try, we'll try one more in this set. We'll try number 30. Secant minus tangent times secant plus tangent all over secant. Now, you've got a lot of options, as you always do. But one option would be to foil these two together. They, they aren't just random. They're very closely related. It's secant minus tangent times secant plus tangent. And you know enough about the difference of squares to know that stuff's going to cancel when you multiply those together. So let's just go ahead and foil it. Um, and that should make it a little bit easier to work with. So when I foil it, I'm going to get secant squared. Now this one and this one are going to cancel. Outside and inside are going to cancel. And I'm going to be left with just minus tangent squared. This is causing my heart to pitter-patter again. And I always have to write this down because I can never remember the identity. The Pythagorean identity is 1 plus tangent squared is secant squared. So what does secant squared minus tangent squared equal? Well, look, secant squared minus tangent squared. So if I subtract the tangent squared from both sides, secant squared minus tangent squared just equals 1. So that numerator is 1. The numerator is 1. What is 1 over the secant? What is the reciprocal of the secant? This is one of your gold box ident or green box identities. One over secant is cosine. So that one reduces to just cosine. 
Um, how about, how about something like, number 39. This is going to require you to factor, which is kind of what we started with here this morning. So we're going to factor cosine squared plus 2 cosine plus 1. This one is going to factor quite handily. It's a trinomial, just like we started with earlier today. It's a trinomial, and we're going to factor it into two binomial parentheses. I have a cosine squared, so I'm going to multiply cosine times, oh, not that. I'm going to multiply cosine times cosine. And I have a 1. I'm going to multiply 1 times 1. And everything's added, so I'm just going to fill in with plus signs. Now this is my first one I've done, so I'm going to go ahead and foil it together to make sure I'm right. This gives me cosine squared. This gives me cosine. This gives me cosine. And this gives me 1. That, these add together, so that is indeed what I started with. So those are the factors for cosine squared plus 2 cosine plus 1. Now, number 40 is exactly the same. Exactly the same concept. Factors are going to look a little different. First of all, it's sort of backwards, so I'm going to put the 1 here and the 1 here. And then I'm going to have a sine and a sine. And this time, since the problem has a minus in it, I'm going to use minus signs. Let's double check. If I factor, or yeah, factor, or foil it back together, if I foil it back together, I get 1 minus sine minus sine plus sine squared. And indeed, that does give me what I wanted. So there are my factors. Be on the lookout for something like number 41. Forty-one says one minus two sine plus one minus cosine squared. Now again, I know you've just started, but this is special. This is very, very special. Sine squared plus cosine squared is one. So what happens if you subtract cosine squared from both sides? This is just sine squared. It would behoove you to know that 1 minus cosine squared is sine squared, and 1 minus sine squared is cosine squared. These are not new identities. They are simply rearrangements of the biggie. This is the fundamental trigonometric identity. These are just rearrangements of it. So now this looks exactly like the problem we just did and would factor in that way. Now look at number 42, last one, number 42. Okay, we're gonna have a problem here. This does not factor thing. It's got sines and cosines in it. Not good. Do you have a thought? Think about the one we just did. Do you have a thought about this? What if we took this guy right here? He's a cosine squared. What if we replaced him with 1 minus sine squared? 